They demanded you worship them as God. The Christians were persecuted heavily by Rome because they said that Jesus is Lord. They used the name Lord Kairos. They used the name for, for Lord that actually should only be used for the emperor. In other words, they're saying the emperor is not God. Jesus is. And so they said, well, you're in rebellion against our empire. And Pergamum, for that whole region, they took pride in the fact that they were the center of emperor worship for the whole region. And most other cities in the ancient world, there was one day a year where they would worship the emperor. And if you as a Christian didn't worship the emperor that day, they would execute you. They'd throw you in prison, beat you up and crucify you. Okay? Pergamum was different. Pergamum did this daily. Other cities, you know... 365 days of the year or whatever, you can relax and then that other day you've got to really maybe go on a picnic outside the city or something, you know. Um, Pergamon was every day they were demanding emperor worship. You need to declare the emperor is God. Um, on top of that, in Pergamon, and I don't have time to share the whole story in history, but it's amazing. In, in Pergamon, there was the temple of Zeus. Mm -hmm. Now, Zeus is the chief Greek god. Uh, he's called uh, Jupiter to the Romans and Zeus to the Greeks. And um, Antipas was actually martyred in the temple or on the temple of Zeus. And the temple of Zeus, it was built like a big throne. It's kind of built this way. And the, the temple altar area was here. And... Um, the big idol of Zeus was there. And it was the main place that they worshipped Zeus in the, in the pagan world. And um, the way that they executed Antipas was, uh, and this is a, the Greeks used to do this a lot, it's horrifying. There's this huge big bronze bull. And the bronze bull is hollow. And what they would do is they would open up the belly of the bronze bull and they would put the person inside. So Antipas was put inside alive, tied up inside the bronze bull. Mm -hmm. And they place around his face a mask with a tube. The tube would go to the mouth of the bull. Then they would get firewood underneath the bronze bull and they would light the firewood and they would roast the person alive inside the bull. Slow death. And so as you're burning, you start, oh, oh, the pain would start. And then it would get worse and worse as you're screaming. And that would come out like the bull has come alive. Oh. Um, the ancient world was very harsh. So Antipas, for his faith, was martyred that way. Because he refused to worship the emperor. And he refused to acknowledge the worship of Zeus or Jupiter. Um, I want you to know something that's very interesting is... Um, if you study the book of Revelation and Jesus in Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is the clearest teaching on the signs of the end times. Jesus teaching, it's really clear what will happen in the end times. And Jesus makes a statement. He says, uh, for you that have understanding, understand. You that have understanding, interpret this. Understand what Daniel meant when he talked about the abomination of desolations. As a major sign for the last days, when you see the abomination of desolation, then you know that the end has come. And the abomination of desolation has been fulfilled in history already several times. This is what we call minor fulfillment of prophecy. Prophecy, end time prophecy has minor fulfillment and major fulfillment. The final major is the second coming of Jesus. Before Jesus comes, we will see the abomination that causes desolation when the Antichrist declares himself as God and demands the world worship him as God. That's coming. That's the fulfillment. But you see, in the past what happened is, um, it's before Jesus came, after Daniel prophesied, and there was a Greek general, and that Greek general conquers uh Israel and the surrounding regions and he demands that they start to worship Zeus and what he actually does is he he goes into the temple in Jerusalem 
And in the most holy place of the temple, that we should worship the most holy God, Yahweh, in the most holy place, he sets up an altar with an idol of Zeus. And he commands all of Israel to worship Zeus. Then he goes outside and he, on the altar where they would make sacrifices to Yahweh, which was usually lambs or bulls, what he did was he got pigs, oh. which is an unclean animal in the scripture. He gets pigs and he sacrifices the pigs on the altar to defile the altar and he sacrifices pigs to Zeus. Oh. And at that time, anyone in Israel that did not worship Zeus, they were imprisoned, they were beaten, they were martyred, they were kicked out of their jobs, they were persecuted in many ways. Until a, a group of people called the Maccabees arose. Mm. And if, you, if you're Catholic, you have in your Bible uh, what is called the Apocrypha. Mm. The Apocrypha <laughs> includes a number of extra books. And 1st and 2nd Maccabees is in the Catholic Bible. And that's the history of the Maccabees. Mm. Uh, and for history's sake, it's, very, it's a good book to read. Good, uh, good history to understand. Because Daniel prophesied about the Maccabees. The Maccabees led a re revolution against the Greeks that were the ruling power at that time. The Greeks were ruling before Rome. Mm. Okay? And so the Maccabees, led a, they were all priests. The leaders of the movement, they were priests that said, We will worship Yahweh and Yahweh alone, and we will they've defiled the temple of Yahweh, and we're going to take up weapons and we're going to fight against the Greeks because they've done this thing, and we refuse to worship the Greek gods. And, and so they led a revolution, and they actually defeated the, this ancient Greek empire. The, the world ruling empire of that day, the, the Israelites defeated them. And then what they did is they went into the temple, they destroyed the, the idol of Zeus. But at that time, uh, the Greeks in Pergamum built the temple or the throne. It's called the throne or the temple of Zeus. Uh, at the time that it was destroyed in Jerusalem, it, they went there. And um, that's where Antipas, after Jesus now in Revelation, uh, that's where Antipas was actually crucified at the altar of Zeus's temple, the leader of the church. Um, you need to know in the 1800s, around 18... 70, a German archaeologist mm. went to Pergamon and the German archaeologist discovered where the temple of Zeus or the throne of Zeus used to be because you know after years of when Christianity took over Pergamon, later the Muslims took over Pergamon and the temple of Zeus just disappeared, it fell apart and everything. But this German archaeologist found it and he uncovers it Stone by stone, idol by idol, he moves the whole temple of Zeus, which by the way, if you haven't picked it up, this is the throne of Satan that they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You see? The throne of Satan. He moves the whole temple of Zeus from Pergamon, which is in Turkey, into Berlin, Germany. Mm -hmm. And by around 1880... I think it's 1879 actually. They brought all of the throne of Satan into Berlin, Germany. All of it's there. And they start to reassemble it. And that's when Germany becomes its own nation. Before that, Germany was part of Prussia. Mm -hmm. Prussia was an ancient empire. Now Germany, it separates from Prussia and it becomes its own empire. And that's the year Adolf Hitler gets born. Mm -hmm. Just so you can see something. Um, Adolf Hitler gets born that year. And then they start to rebuild the, the temple of Zeus in Berlin. And they put it all together. And they finish it around 1911, 1912. In 1914, the First World War begins. The worst war the world has ever seen. The most people in a war that have ever been killed. World War I begins when the Temple of Zeus and Germany was the nation that instigates World War I. Okay, now what they do is they build a thing called the Pergamon Museum. And they build the Pergamon Museum around the Temple of Zeus 
to, to honor it, and they fill it with all the ancient idols that they've collected from ancient Greek temples, etc. And, and the Pergamum Museum is actually built in the same shape as the Temple of Zeus, and they finish it in 1930. Okay. Before 1930, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party was um, a minor party in Germany. They had no real power and they, they were very weak and they would not win many elections. But in 1930, there was an election and they became the second most powerful party in all of Germany. Soon after that, they took over Germany. Adolf Hitler and the Nazis took over Germany. Mm. When the throne of Satan had been fully established and honoured in Berlin, Adolf Hitler comes to power. Okay. When Adolf Hitler comes to power, he gets an architect to now design for him in a city called Nuremberg. And if you understand history, mm. you'll, you'll know about Nuremberg. Okay. And this, this guy in Nuremberg is where Adolf Hitler... He, he has all of his big rallies. And you see photos of it with all of the army, millions of soldiers and people, and they're there, just hail Hitler. They're worshipping Hitler, literally. So Adolf Hitler wants a podium to stand on in Nuremberg that he can, he can make his decrees and his declarations of his third right, his world empire. And so what they do is the architect goes into the Pergamon Museum, looks at the throne of Zeus, and he designs Adolf Hitler's podium from the throne of Zeus. Adolf Hitler stands where the altar or the idol of Zeus would stand, and he declares what they call the final solution. Yeah. Wipe out all the Jews. See, the abomination of desolation, whenever it appears in history, there's a great... Um, anti-Semitic move against Israel and the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Satan hates the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. The Antichrist is also anti-Semitic, and the anti-Semitic thing is also anti-Christ. And uh, so we know many Christians, true Christians, suffered at that time. I'm just trying to let you to see this letter we're reading, the message to the church in Pergamum, the throne of Satan was real, there's real power, the whole Holocaust, 8 million That's Jews, right. plus there was something like um, Seven million others, uh, disabled people, uh, there was also uh, Jews, the gypsies, uh, black African uh, descended people. They're all executed. It's more than six million Jews, plus the Second World War. That's the abomination that causes desolation. Now we know that in history, what happened with Nazi Germany is just a foreshadow of something greater coming. The final Antichrist, he, he won't be um, just a very limited like Adolf Hitler. He's going to have power across the earth. And we know that in those days, there's going to be the spirit of anti-Semiticism will rise. Mm. That's anti-Jew, anti-Israel, as well as anti-Christ, anti-Christian. Mm. And we're already seeing, if you watch television, you already see, even in the UN, there's increasing anti-Israel sentiment. And, you know, uh, Israel can do no good, you know, according to the media. You know, the, the, uh, the whole thing of the Palestinians, they can fire a thousand missiles and Israel fires back three and, and the three that Israel fires back is in the media. Why? Our media is full of anti-Semitism. That's right, yeah. And now it's increasingly, did you notice, anti-Christian. Mm, yeah. So we live in the day that the throne of Satan's power is arising across the earth. And we as, by the way, we as Christians need to learn how to pray for Jerusalem as we've been commanded to do from Scripture. And Israel has a very important place in the end time right, yeah. uh, agenda. Mm. So anyway, I'm just sharing all of that as a history because here we see these Christians are living in the city where Satan's throne is. There's major demonic power and there's persecution against the people of God. Mm. Antipas was just one who was martyred in that city. So Jesus is praising the church for this. They're doing good in this area. However, now Jesus has a correction or a rebuke. 
And you think, well, man, with all of that, you know, like, have mercy on them, Jesus. You know, like, but, but there's something going on now with this church. Yes, they're being faithful. Yes, they run around boldly doing evangelism, saying, I will not deny Jesus. I am a true follower of Jesus. I am not going to bow to that idol of the Buddha or that idol to Zeus or whatever it is. And these are, are people that declare their faith boldly. Even they face opposition for it. But now there's a problem. Here's the problem. You who have ears to hear, hear what the Holy Spirit's saying to the church. That's what Jesus himself says at the end of this letter. See, there is a prophetic message and we need to interpret it because God wants to speak to us. That's right. Okay. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food that sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Okay. So Jesus said, there's something I've got against you. And by the way, not everybody in the church was doing this. He says, there's some among you. There's certain members of your community that are doing this. Not everybody. But I need to address this because it's a cancer that will spread if we don't deal with it. That's right, yeah. You know, Jesus said, sin is like a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. Yeah. And so if you allow sin to go on and go on, unaddressed in a person's life or in the church, what happens is their ungodly example starts to disciple people into ungodliness. That's right, yeah. Okay, so Jesus is saying, okay, some among you are doing this, but one of the big rebukes was this, is they were tolerating what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Now that's the big rebuke. Some of them were doing it. The ones that weren't doing it were tolerating it. In other words, they weren't confronting it. They weren't saying that this is wrong, you need to change. They're just going, oh, well, God's a God of grace, so I'm not going to do it because I think it's wrong. But if you want to do it, it's up to you. That attitude, tolerance, is actually, in the book of Revelation, dealt with very strongly. We are to be intolerant when it comes to sin. We can love the sinner. We must love the sinner. Jesus did. Never hate sin and hate the sinner with the sin. You don't do that. That's not Jesus. Jesus loves sinners but hates the sin. Okay? So they're following the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. So this group of people were believing a, a lie, and there was, they were going around and teaching each other, like counseling each other, this is okay. Christians, <coughs> discipling Christians, but they were like... Balaam. Now, Balaam was known as a prophet in the ancient world. He would say, I will only ever do what God says for me to do. I will only ever say what God tells me to say. I'm listening to God and I'm obeying God. That's Balaam. But, actually, Balaam followed the voice of his own passions and his own lusts. So Balaam was very hungry for money. That's the first thing. Whatever it takes. And you've got to understand, in this city, Pergamum, if you refuse to worship the emperor and you refuse to bow before the idols of Zeus, you will lose your job. That's like in China, if you don't say, you know, um, uh, you know, we commit our life fully to Mao Zedong, then you're not going to get a good job. At least it's different now, but it used to be that way in China. Because that, actually Mao Zedong was an antichrist, actually. Um, but the thing is, here is the test. If I want to have a good job and I want to continue to have a good income in this city, and Pergamon was a very rich city, there was a lot of wealth in Pergamon. But if I want to, I've got to compromise myself. If I want to continue to have a good job, I've got to compromise my faith. In a sense, I've got to bow the knee before the idols of the enemy. You know, Satan's temptation with Jesus. Satan goes, he shows him all the glory of all the kingdoms of the world. That talks about all of the wealth, all the power, all of the money, all of the position, all of the fame. And Satan shows him all the glory of all the kingdoms and says, Do you want this, Jesus? Well, just bow down and worship me and I'll give it all to you. So this is what's happening in the throne of Satan's city. Satan's coming to the Christians saying, Do you still want to have a good job? Do you still want to have a lot of money? Would you like me to make you rich? I can make you rich and powerful, and I can even give you a government position if you continue to play the game my way. 
And so there were Christians in the city, and, and they would say things like, I really don't worship Zeus in my heart, but I just bowed down before the idol so that I could continue to keep my job. I don't really worship the emperor, but I just said that so that I could get promoted and have, and have more influence for God's sake, you know? Um, they were totally in compromise, but they believed the lie that they were believing. And this is the thing about self-deception. You don't know you're deceiving yourself because you deceived. And self-deception comes like that with compromise and all the arguments and all the reasonings that justify you in compromise come. And so there was Christians in that compromise. And it says here, prophetically, Jesus is saying, what you are doing right now is the same as the people that were doing the, uh, obeying the teachings of Balaam. Mm. Now, Balaam was an abomination to God as a prophet. He always runs around saying he's a prophet. He's only ever going to say or do what God says. But he was actually opposing the people of God. He's opposing the purposes of God. And he had a love of money. Mm. And in the end, God commanded that Balaam be put to death because he's a false prophet. Mm. Um, Balaam, in, in Balaam's day, what happened was... He tries to curse Israel for a king called Balak. Balak offers Balaam uh, incredible treasure, like to make him super rich, uh, because in the ancient times, when they did warfare, they understood it wasn't two armies fighting that would determine who would win. It was actually the power of your God. Mm. And so what they would do before they'd enter into battle is that they would worship their gods, they'd make all sorts of blood sacrifices and offerings, and then they call on their gods to give them spiritual power so their army could conquer the enemy's army. So literally, um, Israel would call on Yahweh, and the other nations, they'd call on the demonic powers. Okay? So, Balak gets Balaam to cry out to God and ask God for power. To curse Israel. So when Balaam comes, the interesting thing is because he's coming now against Israel, he needs to now buy the God of Israel. That's how they work in the pagan world. Okay, I'm going to bribe.